Okay, why don't we begin with a word of prayer, and, uh, and let's get into our presentation. Let us kneel before the Master as we start this day. Our Father, we, uh, we come together so grateful that you have given to us these precious hours uh, to learn at your feet. I personally am very grateful, Father, for the rich privilege that is mine to be used of you. But Lord, uh, let us not make any mistake that these presentations and the truths we are seeing are not man-fabricated. They are yours. They are eternal. And so, Lord, it is to you, the eternal God, that we turn to at this time that you will continue uh, what you started yesterday and teach us. We pray, Lord, once more for that precious blood, that blood that was spilled for us, Father, to wash away our sin, for the righteousness of your dear Son to cover us, because we know, Lord, that sin separates, but we don't want to be separated from you. We ask that your presence, Lord, will fill this room, that the Holy Spirit will be poured out in mighty cataracts upon us, Father, Lord, we know that the hour is late. This message is the message that we need to be hearing. The, the, the message of transformation is the message of the hour. And, uh, and Lord, um, for a long time, we've kind of liked it down here. And that's why we're still here. And so I just pray that you'll help us to get a glimpse of heaven that, that we won't like it here anymore. And we'll want to go home with you. And we thank you for that. But Lord, I pray that that as we study these things today, that we will do it in the light of the cross. I pray, Lord, that you will speak uh, through me, that your grace will be manifested. Because, Lord, and when we see Jesus and we see what we're really like, it is very frightening. It is very discouraging. But help us to look away from self and look to Jesus, who is our Savior and friend and our great high priest, and we thank you. So may your angels once again present a ring of fire around our room. Lord, that we'll be shut into your presence as you teach us. May you enter here, Father, and impress our hearts and minds to your glory and honor. And I pray that those who wish to come, that you remove the obstacles that have been keeping them. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Just a little review. Um, you know, we're learning that the sanctuary teaches us the path to the throne of God. And we, we've learned that the atonement did not take place at the cross, but the provisions for the atonement were. All the provisions. But the final atonement takes place here. And we've learned that in the outer court, we learned that the sanctuary teaches us how to become Christians, and that the sanctuary itself teaches us how to remain Christians. We have learned that in the outer court, we've learned about the victory over the record of sin. God gives us victory. He gives us a new path when we give our lives to him. And we call that justification. And then we learn in the holy place, victory over the power of sin. That we don't have to live as slaves to sin anymore. That through the power of Christ, we can live above its power. By the way. There are a lot of Adventists out there, as well as non-Adventists, who are preaching another gospel. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. From what? Mm -hmm. From sin. How, how free? Completely. Completely. But it is a process, and we'll be looking at that. And that's called sanctification. Then we're going to learn that in the end, God is going to give us victory over the presence of sin, and that's mm -hmm. glorification. But the whole idea, what this is to teach us, is how God intends to save the sinner while destroying the sin. That's the whole deal. And, uh, and that's what it's all about. And so today what we're going to be looking at is um, the judgment. Now, anyone not get any hand up? Okay, we see a few hands. All right. I think I saw three hands. Did I see three or four? One more? Okay, read one more. We're looking at session four. Oh, a mistake has been made. They made the wrong copies. Uh, can we have them do copies yes. of okay. session four? You can share? No. You only need it. How many? Um, that's odd. Um, let's, get, let's get ten. Ten of session These four. These are only session one? That's session one. We're all in session one, or any of the sessions? No, they were. Oh, they're all in there. Yeah, they're in there. 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 I need more sleep. Yeah. Yes, I am your teacher today. Could you pass it? Okay. 
Yes, they're in there. My humble apologies. <laughs> they're in there. But we're looking at session four, the good news of the judgment. You know, when we talk about the judgment, uh, people get scared to death when they talk about the judgment. It strikes terror into their hearts. But when you study the Bible and you listen to the Bible writers talk about the judgment, it was always with enthusiasm. It was always good news because... The Bible writer understood that the judgment would result in the condemnation of evil and the ultimate vindication and triumph of truth. They understood that. And so to them, they knew that the judgment would be in their favor because they loved the Lord. They wanted God to be the king of their life. And the judgment is, uh, is positive for them. Do you have your side? Okay, you got your paper with you. Yeah. So what we're going to do at this session is what we're going to do is we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about the judgment. We're going to look at the mechanics, the mechanics of the judgment. When we're done, my prayer is that you will not be afraid of God. I'm going to show you that God is not the one that we're supposed to be afraid of in the judgment. I'll show you. I'm going to show you stuff to the Lord tonight. But I'm going to show you just what it is we're supposed to be afraid of. But it's not him. Then what we'll do is in section two, we're, we're going to then flesh out the investigative judgment and find out how does this apply to me today? In other words, while Jesus is up there cleansing the sanctuary, what's supposed to be going on down here? And we're going to look at that on a practical level, on an everyday level. We're going to look at that. What does that look like? And then the third thing that we're going to look at is an overview of the judgment. We're going to look at phase one, two, and three. The investigative judgment is only phase one. There are three phases to the judgment. One judgment, three aspects. Just like one God, three aspects. Think that's a coincidence? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. Just like the, the sanctuary, three, three aspects. Holy place, most holy place, out of court. Three aspects. So let's begin with number one in our studies. Can we be certain that there will be a judgment? And in Acts 17.31, we find these words. God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world. And so we're looking at October 22, 1844. I'm not going to go through Daniel's uh, 22 day prophecy now. I'm assuming you know that. But that is the day. Let's take a look here at number two, because number two shows us the event being fleshed out there in Daniel 7, 9, 10, 13, and 14. And this is how Daniel describes that scene. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated. The books were open. I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him here before him. And this is actually the event. It's kind of neat there when you talk, when you, you know, we talk about thousands and ten thousands. These are all the angelic hosts. And if, uh, and if you look inside the sanctuary, uh, you see angels, 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 angels on the curtain of above. Why? It was to give us a, a vision, an, an idea of what was happening up in heaven, that this was being watched and, and, and witnessed by angels. So God is trying to just kind of bring us into the scene. Uh, let's take a look here at number three. <coughs> Who will be brought into the judgment? Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You know that today, uh, if one of us commits a crime, we can get a lawyer, and we don't have to show up at the court. The, the lawyer can represent us. Are you with me? And so this is what, when we all have to appear before the judgment seat of God, uh, if Jesus Christ is your lawyer, he will represent you there. You don't have to be there uh, right now. He can do that. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. so, so we have uh, an example here on earth. But the reality is it's a, it's a sobering time. We've got we to understand the day in which we live. You know, we assume we're going to make it home tonight after these meetings. Yeah, we don't have that assurance. Mm -hmm. We don't. You know, can, can, I, can I just kind of turn up the heat on this a little bit more? You know, uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about this tonight. In 1898, Ellen White made this comment. She said, Christ could have come very long before now. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Have you, have you, any of you ever remember hearing that? Mm -hmm. She said, Christ could have come here long before now. Now we gotta stop and think about this for a moment. This woman understood the judgment. When the judgment began, judgment begins with the righteous dead. Mm -hmm. Then it shifts to the living. I hear Adventists today who have uh, a, a knowledge of the sanctuary see things like, you know, I wonder when it's gonna pass to the living. Dear friend, if in 1898 she said Christ could have come before now, wow. it has passed. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Our lives are under review. It is a dangerous thing to put that off into the future. Mm -hmm. It is now. It is now. I don't know about you, but if the policeman showed up at my door and handed me a subpoena, it would have my attention. I'd be thinking about it day and night. I'd want to find out what the charges were and I'd be looking for a lawyer. We need to be doing the same. We need to be doing the same. Number four, with which class will the judgment begin? First Peter 4, 17. For the time will come for judgment to begin where? The house of God. At the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel? It's very interesting. But Peter here is saying, hey, if your kid's with us, what do you think is going to happen to those guys? <laughs> what is he saying? You see, when, when, when we ask God, if you remember, when we ask for forgiveness, the sin is transferred, remember, to the lamb, mm -hmm. and then the blood is brought into the bowl, and then the high priest would go and transfer it by, by sprinkling it into uh, the sanctuary, remember? Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, the sin, the sinner, the sin goes to the lamb, into the blood, into the sanctuary, and that went all year, all year long. And then there had to be a service that would cleanse that record of sin out. But the sins that were in here were only the sins of those that were placed on the lamb. Mm -hmm. So Peter's saying, if judgment begins with those whose sins were placed on the lamb, what's going to happen to those who their sins were not placed on the lamb? Open your Bible. And take a look here at something very important in John chapter 3. We all know John chapter 3. That beautiful verse that talks about God's love being so much, so great that he sent the Son to die for us. Well, let's take a look at another verse. Because this is what Peter is alluding to. Well, in fact, we ought to probably read John 3.16 first. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Now look at 17, how precious. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now 18, the clincher. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. See, God didn't have to condemn him. He's condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The reality is that when Adam and Eve sinned, the, the whole angelic host, the Almighty says, looked on the scene in total despair because they recognized the fact that humanity was lost. There was no way. And so we have to understand the reality, my brother right there, that, that apart from Christ, there's no hope. It's game over. So the only way out of a lost condition is Jesus. That's it. And so, so the investigative judgment, if you're not investigated, it's because it's over for you. So you want to be investigated. <laughs> Are you with me? Yeah. Being in phase one, the investigative judgment, is a good deal. It is a good deal. Um, so what we find, though, is that the judgment begins with those who claimed that Jesus was their Savior. You see, all heaven is interested in who's going to show up. This mess started in their backyard. They don't want any more of it. <laughs> and so they want to make sure that whoever is going in is okay, that they are safe to save. They are safe to save. Do they really want you to be the Lord over them, Lord? We just want to make sure. And so heaven has a vested interest in this as well. And, and so they watch carefully, and they want to make sure that those who go really are really meant it. Um, they're very, very important. So they're investigating to see the genuineness of the commitment. Anybody can call themselves a Christian. Anybody can. But are they? That's the question. And so there has to be an investigation to see. 
Number five. Who is the prosecuting attorney? This is any of you have ever spent any time in the courtroom scene? This is going to just make sense. <laughs> and if you haven't, if you ever get called in to, to do jury duty, pay attention and, and make spiritual connections. It's amazing. Revelation 12, 9 and 10 says, The great dragon called the devil and Satan. What is he? He is the accuser of you and me. That many of us believe that the accuser is God. That somehow, tell me if you haven't seen this, that Jesus is standing between us and the Father. And he's saying, no, Lord, not this one, please. <laughs> Leave this one alone. It's not true. It is a lying devil. Jesus doesn't stand between us and the Father. The Father's like, stand aside, son. <laughs> but oftentimes, we get this picture in our mind. And it's demonic. It's not true. I want you to open your Bibles. Let's take a look at John chapter 16. John 16. <clears throat> you there? Yeah. John 16. And I'm going to read verse 27. For the Father himself loves you. Because you have loved me, and I believe that I have come forth from God. He loves you. Do you know how much? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. While we were still enemies, he gave his son. How can we get this picture that he's trying to find a way to keep us out? How in the world? It's demonic. God, Father is not at all the, uh, the accuser. He is, and I want to show you another text. Take a look at Luke, chapter 12. Luke, chapter 12. And uh, if you're there, Luke 12, I'm going to read verse 32. Do not, do not what? Fear. Do not fear, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you what? The kingdom. The kingdom. He's not trying to find a way to keep us out. He's trying desperately to get us in. Yeah. And, and Ellen White makes it very clear that God is more anxious for us to be saved than we are. Yeah. He is more anxious. Father is not the accuser. He is the prince of darkness. Yeah. Number six. And by the way, he keeps good books, too. He keeps good records. He knows what he's led us to do. Number six. Who is the defense attorney? 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not what? we got to remember that, man. That's coming out everywhere. And if anyone does, we have an advocate, which is another name for a lawyer, with, with the Father. Who is who? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. You have a lawyer. If you ask him to be your Savior, you have a lawyer. Now let's continue here. Who's the judge? Now watch this. John 5, 22. For the Father judges no one. The Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to who? The Son. To the Son. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna share something with you that's gonna they may throw some of you off, and Lord help me to explain this well. When when Jesus was working in here prior to 1844, he was ministering, and uh, he was mediating between the Father and us. Amen? Amen? He was mediating. You have the table of showbread, you have the menorah of the light, and you have the incense. Okay. When Jesus, any of you who have done any research or reading into Advent's history, I'm just wondering here. None of you. Okay. When Jesus, <laughs> listen, listen, you really need to. It'll, it'll make your heart sore. It'll make your heart sore. If you, you read the history of this church, friend, you're going to find a group of young people this movement began with people in their teens and twenties who knew they had a role to win. And they pinned their, in, their ears back and they leaned hard into it and they gave it everything they got. You've got to read the history of this church. It's amazing. But when, when they moved, when Jesus moved from the holy into the most holy, at, at first they thought that probation's door had closed for everybody. Because why? Because Jesus did his ministry, his, his mediating here, not here. 
here was judging. And so that kind of, that, then you'll often hear the early on the shut door theory is what they called it. And so they just thought in October 22, 1944, when Jesus did come, they thought, well, then what did happen? Well, maybe that meant that was close to probation. As they're still processing through it for everybody. And then people were continuing to set the message, and they thought, well, maybe probation is going to close. And as they continued to study, they began to realize that in here you have the menorah, right? And um, you have the presence of God, right? Uh, and then you have um, the incense, the high priest, the high priest outfit. You had the incense that was also brought in by the priest. So why am I bringing out these three elements? Because all three elements that exist in the holy were found in the most holy. So what that was telling, suddenly they began to realize that when Jesus came in here and began the judgment, he was still mediating. So the mediation didn't, didn't cease, so we can still ask for forgiveness, and Jesus applies his blood to the sin. Are you with me? Yeah. So the door of probation was still open. So when you read in the great controversy of the judgment scene, when Jesus is claiming his blood for the people, don't confuse that with the Father judging. What's happening is, is Jesus is mediating. But he's both mediating and judging. But when it comes to the judging, it's just the Son doing it. When it comes to the mediating, then he's mediating before the Father. You're going to see the both scenes. Don't let that confuse you. Are you with me? Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah. Okay. So I want to make sure to clarify that. But mediation is still taking place in the most holy place. All right. So we understand that the Father is not judging. Now, are you afraid of the Father in the judgment? No. No. But who are we to fear? We'll see. Number eight. Our study of the Bible will reveal three phases in the judgment. We're going to go through this quickly. And in our last session, I'll flesh it out a little more. Our last session here before tonight's talk. Phase one is the investigation of the righteous. All right? And you already talked about how their sins were transferred to the sanctuary. If, if found not guilty, they are acquitted and set free. But if they are found guilty, then they proceed to phase two and three. And that's where the rest of the world is, phase two and three. Phase two is the sentencing stage for the lost. That's all you do. There's no judging there. <laughs> they, they were lost to begin with. And they never accepted Jesus. So they're, they're sent there. And that takes place during the millennium. And we're going to touch on that a little bit. The sentencing stage. Then you have phase three of the judgment, which is the, which is the executive portion. And that is when the punishment is carried out. Are you with me? Yes. And we're going we're gonna to look at all three of those. OK, number nine. What are the books talked about in Daniel 7.10? Remember it says that the books were open? The book of, actually it's called the book of iniquity. I've got to turn that around. book of iniquity, which is sin. Jeremiah 2.23, your iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord God. So that's one of the books the Bible talks about. There's also the book of remembrance, Malachi 3.16. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear God and who meditate on his name. And in that book of remembrance, all our acts that are good are recorded. So not only all of our bad stuff is recorded, but all the good stuff is recorded. And then there is the book of life. Revelation 3, 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Now, when you and I ask Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior, our name automatically is placed in the book of life. That's the only way to get in there. It's the only way. And your name remains there until the end of the investigative judgment. Because in the investigative judgment, the only people that are investigated are those whose names are in the book of life. That's it. Those who made a profession to serve the Lord. And so what happens is, they're going to see if the profession matches the reality in the life. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. We're with me? You with me? All right. If you have questions, raise your hand. It's not a sermon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> question? Uh, I wonder, what about the people that should work, they don't have the privilege to know Jesus? Uh, Paul talks about the fact that, uh, and I can't remember the text right now, but it, basically the idea is that those who know to do right, that, that is their standard. So, in other words, the native out in the jungles who one day uh, he's part of a cannibalistic tribe, and, and one day he sees this hawk take out a dove, and it hits the ground, the Holy Spirit impresses his heart that violence is wrong. And he says, you know what? I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to kill anybody anymore. 
So he's going to pay a price. But he's made the decision, and he has no idea that the Holy Spirit has impressed him, and he's responded. And, and if you look at the books, if you open your Bible to, I think it's Zephaniah, there's a very interesting thing there that is recorded for us, and I find it to be rather beautiful. Oh, Zephaniah. Is Zephaniah or Zechariah? Is Zechariah. Let's try Zechariah. Okay, Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah 13. Are you there? Say amen. Amen. Yeah. One more time. Say mercy. <laughs> <laughs> We're there. Zechariah uh, 13, look at verse 6. And someone will say to him, What are those wounds in your hands? And he will answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Mm -hmm. Precious. So there will be people there. Ellen White, in the great controversy at the very end, describes a very interesting scene. She says that the redeemed will form a hollow square around Christ, and there will be three groups deep. The outer group will consist of those who the missionary never showed up. Oh, wow. The second group will be those who affected Christian character and were martyrs. But the inner group that will stand closest to Christ are the biggest sins. That's what she says. That's precious. Let's take a look here at number 10. What is the standard by which all will be judged? Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. And by the way, that fear is not afraid. It's reverence and respect. Reverence and respect. That's not to be afraid. That's crazy. The Bible tells us that God has loved us with an everlasting love and with loving kindness he is drawing us. You can't, you can't draw, be drawn to someone you're afraid of. <laughs> and the devil wants us to be afraid of so we just kind of at a distance. Lord, I'm, I'm on your side, but you stay there, I'll stay here, we're good with that. That's not what he wants. With loving kindness, I have drawn him. Ellen White says that the children, when Jesus was preaching, would just walk up to him and uh, they'd crawl into his lap and just gaze into his eyes. They'd fall asleep in his arms as he was preaching. Is that someone to be afraid of? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every what? Secret, Secret thing. thing. Whether it is good or whether it is evil. And you know, so often, my friends, so we're, the Bible says that when we compare ourselves amongst ourselves, that's foolish. It's only foolish. It's lethal. We need to be comparing ourselves to Christ. In the Ten Commandments, we have the character of God revealed to us. But in the life of Jesus, it is demonstrated. If you want to know what the law looks like in the heart, look at Jesus Christ. And so when we're looking at the judgment, we're looking at the law, not only in written form, but in living. We're to compare our lives to Christ. You know, it's easy for us to say, you know, okay, I know I'm not perfect, but I am better than the pastor. I mean, look at the pastor does, look at the things he does. Well, the truth is the pastor may be lost in you too. So why in the world would you want to compare yourself to him? Look to Jesus and compare your life to Jesus and not to anyone else. By the way, by beholding you become... Changed. And if you look at everybody else's stuff, you're going to become like their stuff. Mm -hmm. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. That's the key, and that's the standard. In James 2.12, so speak and do as those who will be judged by the law of what? Liberty. Of liberty. And that law is the essential personality of God. It's God. By the way, it's very interesting that in the Bible, you see, by, by coming to know God, we're transformed into that image. You realize that? As you study, we talked about that. That's the process. And, and when, when we study the Bible, unfortunately, many of, we've seen this and we've heard it, that we divorce the doctrines from God. The Jews did this. Mm -hmm. They knew which day was the right day, they knew the health message, but they never connected it with a relationship with God. And, but, but when you start looking at what doctrine is, doctrine is teaching. Teaching about what? About who he is. So as, as God reveals, and, and by the way, you cannot see truth unless the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. Amen. Understand that. When you're studying the Bible in the morning by yourself, and suddenly you have an aha moment, guess who was there and touched your mind? Wow. It was the God. It was God. Mm -hmm. He touched your mind. 
spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And so as, as we're studying new doctrine and we come to understanding, what God is doing is he's revealing himself to you. He's inviting you into a deeper relationship with him by coming to know who he is. Isn't that why people court? I won't say Dave, but that's another story. But, <laughs> but isn't why they do that? Because they want to know who, what the other person is. And as they reveal more about themselves, this is the affections grow. Mm -hmm. And so when God reveals truth to us, for example, when we read the Sabbath, what does it tell us? I made you, by the way. If you're not a creationist, then why, what's the motivation for worshiping God? Because he's bigger than you? Because he can destroy you? What's your motivation? But when you come to the realization that he made you, he created you, you're here because he wanted you to be. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing thought. And so when we begin to realize, oh, you made me? So that's my relationship to you. And so when we look about the one that says, uh, don't commit adultery, what is God telling us about relationships? They're important to him. You know, when you read the one that says, don't commit murder, what is, or don't kill, what's God saying about killing people? Yeah, you know what, life means something. something to me. It's valuable to me. So everything in the Bible that's a teaching is revealing to us something about God. Why am I sharing this? Because when we reject a truth, we're not just rejecting a concept. We're rejecting the person. Jesus said, I am. Reject truth or reject person. Very important. So in the judgment, the Ten Commandments is God is a demonstration of God's essential personality. That is the standard. Not the past. That's the standard. What will the judgment bring to light? Ecclesiastes tells us 12, 13, and 14, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing. By the way, that includes our motives. Mm -hmm. So, so many times we do good things, and our good things are stained and contaminated with self. Mm -hmm. God has to clean that out of us. Uh, Matthew 12, 36 and 37, including every what? I don't know. I don't, word. I don't know about you, I need a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I need the blood of Jesus no. to wash that away. Yeah. 12, what is Jesus? You know, I just want, I, didn't, I do need the shoes. You know, When I came to know my wife, uh, it was after the fact that I came to know Jesus. I gave my life to him. I repented of the things that I had done. And I talked to my wife, and I was very frank with her. I mean, at the time, obviously, she wasn't my wife. We were just starting our dating time. And I sat down and said, you know, it looks like that, that something may develop here. So I just want to be very honest with you. There are things in my past that I don't ever want to relive or talk about to anyone. And, and as far as I'm concerned, that person died. I said, but if it's really important to you to know all about my past, I am so sorry it's not going to happen. And if you're not comfortable with that, I respect that, but this is a good time to end this. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to talk about my past. I'm not going to talk about the things in the past that's over. It's done mm -hmm. for me. Now, in the, in the very end, and when we look at um, the destruction of the wicked, before they're destroyed, there's going to be a panoramic view in heaven, and everybody is going to see the role they play. And they're going to understand more fully why they were destroyed in the end. But we'll flesh that out. And uh, let me tell you what you're not going to see. You're not going to see what I did. Mm -hmm. no. The blood of Jesus mm -hmm. is taking care of my past. You won't see it. No one will. By the grace of God. I just want to share it. Mm -hmm. It makes sense because we have to live together in eternity. You know, why do I need to know your past? That's it. Mm -hmm. That's right. If that person's dead, it makes sense. Yeah. They're dead. Why you will be dead. They're dead. That's gone. It's over. Number 12. What is Jesus seeking to accomplish in his followers, the church, through the judgment process? And this is the key. What is God after? Are you trying, is he checking the list, checking it twice, trying to see who's naughty and nice, trying to see who's going to keep out? No. Ecclesiastes 5 27, or 5 25 to 27. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Why? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Now watch this description. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And that means today. Hmm. That's us today. Hmm. Nobody can, no, no one has to leave this room without being in that condition. you realize that? God only holds us accountable for what we know, not for what we don't know. 
And then as time goes on, we're going to unpack that a little bit. He'll begin the process of showing us what we don't know. Remember we talked about that a little? And in the process, if we, if we ask God for forgiveness immediately, we're still covered by his righteousness? We'll, un we'll unpack that a little more. But the goal is to be like Jesus. You know, during World War II, in the United States, uh, was fighting uh, the Nazi armies in, uh, in Europe. When they were, there was a lot of house-to-house -house combat that would go on. It's a horrible thing. I mean, war is awful. And, and when you're in the house-to-house -house combat, it's even worse because you're really close together and you just never know where the enemy is in house-to-house -house combat when you're going through a, a village or a city. And they were fighting in cities and going house-to-house. -house. And many times, the way they can tell where the other side was was by the sound of their weapons. Because the United States had the, uh, the M1 rifle, the M1 carbine, the Thompson submachine gun, and uh, I forgot what their hand, the Colt 45, their handgun. Yeah. The German army had the, had the Luger, it had the Mauser, it had, I forgot the submachine gun, but their weapons were different. And so they could tell where everybody was by the discharge of the weapons. And so as they were moving through a neighborhood, the Allied forces were moving, and as they were fighting, and all of a sudden they heard an unusual weapon behind them, they knew that one of the, the, the Nazi soldiers had infiltrated their lines, and so they had to send somebody to go back there to take care of that. And so here's my point. You could, you could tell which side of the battle you were on by the weapons you used. And my friends, it's the same thing as spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. You know, turn with me to Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. You know, Paul talks about the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, right? Yeah. There are weapons. Dear friend, and in Galatians chapter 5, we see the weapons of the prince of darkness, beginning in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, and cleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery. What's the next one? Hatred. Hatred. Contention. Jealousy. Outburst of wrath. Selfish ambition. Dissension. Heresies. Envy murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so, so he's showing you the weapons of the prince of darkness. And if you look, verse 21, we see the weapons, I mean, verse 22, the weapons of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And so you can tell which side of the battle you and I are on by whose weapons we're using. Mm -hmm. It's not my profession. It's not that I eat stuff from Worthington Foods or whatever. <laughs> it's, what, it's, it's how we respond. And it's very interesting if you study, there's a series out there by Lewis Walton that talks about the judicial system of, uh, is it that one? I can't remember now. But anyway, I think he, he talks about in the upper room all of the ways that Jesus tried to reach Judas. So you and I don't know the culture, so we don't get it. We just kind of read through and go, oh. But if you if you read, if you know the culture, you'll realize that when he served Judas before first, he was showing him the mm -hmm. When he let Judas sit on his left side, when he washed his feet. Mm -hmm. And what you find suddenly as you begin to unpack the culture is that Jesus turned his weapons on Judas mm -hmm. of love. And that night in the upper room, he fired in full fury to win it. That's how Jesus loves. He loves to death. That is how Jesus loves. And that's how he wants us to. In love. In love. God wants us to be like him. He wants us to be like him. 13. What happens if a sin remains on the book, unrepented of and unforsaken? Exodus 32, 33 says, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. When there remains of sin, unrepented of and unforsaken, God has no control. Ezekiel 18, But when a righteous man turns, this is interesting, a righteous man, we're talking to a church member. When a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, all the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he he is guilty, and the sin which he has committed, he shall die. And so, we see that at the very end of the judgment process, 
Our names are in the book of life. We have sins of remembrance, I mean, our, 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 our record of iniquity and, the, and of our good deeds. And if we ask for the blood of Jesus and forgiveness of our sins, then he erases it. So when the book of iniquity is open, they go, they know the But if the book's open and it's shown that we refuse, then they walk over to the book of remembrance and all the good is removed. Why? Because you and I cannot do any good on our own. Mm -hmm. All that good belongs to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It all belongs to him. 14. But what if I repent of my sin and have turned from it and by faith have claimed the blood of Jesus as my atoning sacrifice? Will my sins be blotted out and my name remain in the book of life? Isaiah 42, 25. out your transgression for my sake and I will not remember your sins. Mm -hmm. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. yes. In Revelation 3, 5 he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garment and I will not blot out his name from the book of life but I will confess his name before my father before the angels. Now when he says overcome what is he referring to? Overcome what? Sin. Why are we hearing more? Number 15, while the investigative judgment is taking place, what is my part? 2 Corinthians, oh uh, Corinthians 13.5 says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Prove yourselves. Do you not know yourself that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. You see, you remember that when we studied on the Day of Atonement, that as the priest was in here, they knew he wouldn't be there all day. And, and so while he was making atonement for the sins of the people, the people were outside searching their hearts to make sure, is there anything that I have not sent in? And if they remembered something, while the priest was in there, that sin would be atoned for, and they confessed it. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. And so that was to be example to the people in the last days, to us. That as Jesus is up there, this is the time for us to be searching our hearts and lives to make sure that everything is right between my soul and my Savior. God has made provision. Okay? And so we need to be searching our hearts to make sure that everything is right. And so the key here is not to make excuses for the sins uh, that we have committed. And I'll flesh that out a little more. I have a text written down here. Oh, now I remember what it is. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. I just want to share this because I don't know if I have a trembling soul here today. Who realizing the gravity of the situation perhaps is discouraged. And 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to read this to you. Dear child of God, trembling child of God. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. We're not going to be saved by our own strength, but by God's. Mm -hmm. But we have to come to the place to recognize that we're weak. And as, uh, and as human beings, we don't like that. We don't like to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So sometimes God, the, the process is prolonged because of that. No, not sometimes. The process is prolonged. But God is gracious mm -hmm. and is working with us. Now what I want to do, I'm just going to read through this together. We're going to read through and watch the process. Note, we must search out our own hearts and lives by comparing ourselves with Jesus and his law. We are not irrevocably locked into salvation by one initial or isolated act of believing. We are called to continue in Jesus. There must be a sustained, persevering commitment to Him, a continuous personal union with Him. And we read that in John 15, uh, 4 and 31. And this is accomplished by choosing Him as our Lord and Savior how often? Every day. Every day. That's why it's called the daily. daily. Consider. If we consider the key importance of the power of choice in our day-to-day -day lives, we will have no difficulty understanding the operation of the pre-advent judgment. Number one, our initial choice to receive Christ by faith puts us in Christ. 
at the moment of our initial commitment, Jesus gives us the legal right to live forever with him. So out here, when we ask Jesus to be our Savior, we commit our lives to him. In heaven, there's a crown with your name on it. And it's waiting for you. Are you with me? You have the legal right. Your name is now inscribed in the book of life. You with me? Let's continue. That's the out-of-court experience. Our sustained habitual faith choices to keep on receiving Jesus keeps us in Christ in a state of perfect security. And there are your texts. That's the connection maintaining it throughout the day. Number three. Uh, consciously and deliberately, we must renew our surrender to Jesus' control on a day-to-day, -day, moment by moment basis. This is what the Bible means by abiding in Him, continuing in the faith, enduring until the end, keeping ourselves in the love of God, and holding fast the beginning <coughs> of our confidence firm unto it. And by the way, that's perfection. Perfection is remaining I had people come up to me all freaked out. I don't believe in the perfection thing. And I, I listen to them and I go, okay. <laughs> I say, can you, can you define it for me? What's perfection? And I get goofy answers. The righteousness is Christ. Our past is perfect. God gives us his. The power to live, yield, and surrender must come from Christ. In the end, you have I. But pastor, I can do good things. It's mm -hmm. too late. You already said. You know, you have to understand that. How many of you are medical in the medical field? One, two, three. Okay. You know that you have surgery going on. You have a little tray table, and you have all the instruments lined up here in the cloth, and you peel the cloth back, right? This is called a what? What do they call that? <laughs> um, but, they, but they call something. Oh, um, Somebody's saying it. it's a sterile field. field. The sterile field. That's what that's called. Because you know, a lot of people come out with infections and surgery and it's bad news. Alright? So you try to keep everything sterile. Alright. What if one of those instruments hits the ground? Can you use it? You can't use it. But don't you see it can still perform? Mm -hmm. It's contaminated. It needs a cleansing agent before it can be used. Follow me. So that your ability to perform is it relevant? Mm -hmm. Is Christ in your heart? Is the question. Mm -hmm. Only then can the performance be acceptable to God. God's not interested mm -hmm. in your righteousness. You don't have it. Mm -hmm. He's only interested in His Son. The only righteousness that God will accept is the righteousness of the Son. That's it. There is no other that He will accept but that of His dear Son. Mm -hmm. So we're looking then that we have to maintain that connection. And, and so what we're looking at here in essence, if I can use almost a silly illustration, but I think it'll it'll work okay. Let's say it's raining outside, and I want victory over wetness. <laughs> and so uh, my dear sister has an umbrella, and I see her out there, and uh, let, me, let, me, let me not do that. Let me do this. I see Jesus outside, and he has the umbrella. And, um, and so what I do is I say to Jesus, uh, I run to Jesus, and as I go to Jesus, I come under the umbrella. And now I have victory over witness. Okay? There I have victory. Now I'm going to go out again? Mm -hmm. You see, I don't just go to Jesus to get victory. I have to stay Jesus, to stay with Jesus, to have it. Jesus is my victory. Are you with me? Every day. Now today you see me before you, a, a, a minister of the gospel. Okay? I don't know what to talk about past. If I stop meeting with Jesus, it's only a matter of time before I will I'll go back to what I was before. It's not my own goodness that has made me what I am before you. It's the goodness of Christ. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so the continual connection each day, that's why I share with you that devotional life is not is as optional for a Christian as breathing. If you stop breathing, you die. And if you stop having a devotional life, you'll die spiritually. The only difference is you won't fall over. And, it happened, and you will be amazed at how many in the congregation are dead or around. Because they're not meeting with Jesus, that's what we get like. You don't get it from anything else or from anywhere else. 
but from hand. That's important. All right, let me stop right here and just for a moment. And we're going to change tapes. Is that making sense? Yes. Is that making sense? All right. I hope that as we're going through here, the fear factor is beginning to come through. And it's not the Father. You're made to find the Father's not in the You ready? All right. So, so we must remain connected daily to Christ. Now look at the next point. One factor, and one factor alone, this is number four, one factor and one factor alone can jeopardize our security and take us out of Christ. That is our own will, our own decision to do things how? Our way. So one element of risk remains. But that lies within ourselves. While no man or demon or circumstance can destroy our security in Jesus, we can destroy that security by carelessness or perversity or neglect. So do we allow Jesus to remain on our hearts day by day? Do we ask him day by day, not just once, every day to remain there is the question. Number five, accordingly, when our individual cases are reviewed in the judgment before Jesus comes to bring his reward with him, only one matter will need to be investigated. Did this man or woman continue to abide in Jesus? Mm -hmm. Remembering that an abiding relationship with Jesus is always manifested in a life of obedience to his commandments. Mm -hmm. We're not saved by church membership. Mm -hmm. You gotta remember who crucified Christ was the church. Mm -hmm. Number six. In the end, mm -hmm. we pass judgment. On ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you a quote, Spirit Prophecy says that. We pass judgment on ourselves. By the consistent quality of our personal day to day choices, we are now deciding or sealing our eternal destiny. A godly character is made up of thousands of individual choices which are now which we are now making in response to the Holy Spirit's prompting. We're either saying yes to the Holy Spirit. We're seeing ourselves. Are you with me? For good or for evil? By the way we respond to God. Number seven. At no point in time, either at conversion, during our Christian lives, or at the judgment, does God act arbitrarily to override or manipulate our power of choice. The decision of heaven's court are not arbitrary. It is our decision that determines the verdict. Heaven simply recognizes that. At the judgment, God takes note of the current quality of our commitment, our current orientation of heart and will, and places his seal of confirmation upon the lifestyle or character that we consistently have chosen. God's verdict in the judgment simply discloses and vindicates the quality and direction of our habitual personal choices. Is God the one to fear? <laughs> In summary, as free moral agents, we are the architects of our own destiny. Our decisions all along the way are what count, not just those at the beginning. Acceptance of Jesus does not make us into robots. The salvation process is not automatic. Our initial commitment to him does not take away our power of choice. We are always free to choose another master. Accordingly, it is not God's future decisions at the judgment that we need to fear. It is our own decisions, the ones that we're making now, and they are under our control. So, who are we to fear in the end? Ourselves. Do not trust yourself, your child. Trust in Jesus. Trust to Jesus. No. These considerations should not rob us of the quiet assurance that all Christians may have. They only protect us from the false assurance of resting comfortably in a relationship that has never existed or one that we have since lost. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Number 16. When the investigative judgment is done, what verdict is reached? Revelation 22, 10 through 14. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. That is the description of the close of probation. And I'll flesh that out a little more in the next study. 
Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, so those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Why? Because the sins have all been transferred now mm -hmm. to a say so. When he returns, it's over. Mm -hmm. Nothing between our soul and our sin. And so let's look at the note. The removal of sin from the sanctuary is the final act of the sanctuary service. Thus, when Jesus is working, the investigative judgment is done. The destiny of all will have been decided for life and death. Probation is ended, and Jesus returns for his children. And number 17, is Jesus able to secure my case before the heavenly court? Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation. And those who what? Are in Christ Jesus, how often? Daily. Continually. All right. Why don't we uh, close this out with a word of prayer? And now what we're going to do is we're going to flesh this out now, and we're going to see the operation. What does this look like in a day-to-day -day life as God is working in me? Let's close out. Father, thank you for being present and your spirit being here, speaking to our hearts and minds, that we can understand more fully what it is that you are now doing up there. We can see the mechanics, Father. It's amazing. It's very similar to the court system we have here. We have a point of reference. And so, Father, now we understand more fully what is happening up there. But, but Lord, we want to understand now is how, how does that affect us here? What does this look like on an everyday basis? And so we pray that you prepare our hearts and minds for that now. We thank you, and we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.